So first up, my disclosures. I have received funding in the past from Canopy, Thera Canopy Therapeutics, um, unrelated to this uh, work that I'll be talking about today, and Metagenics, also unrelated to this work. Okay, so um, how did we get from um, Reef of Madness to, um, I guess, a potential endometriosis medicine? So this is, some of you might have seen this before, there was a big push in the 1950s uh, that marijuana was basically, I don't know who's injecting it, but apparently some people were, um, and it would cause, you know, insanity and madness and I think uh, uh, prostitution and all of that good stuff. Um, and so, you know, it was, it was a major public health issue. Obviously, a lot has changed in those years, but it's quite interesting because there was a lot of research that was actually going on into cannabis. Um, and there's a long history of cannabis use, which we'll talk about, um, especially for kind of reproductive health. Um, and so probably just in the last five or six years, there's been a real um, resurgence into um, the potentials for medicinal cannabis. And a lot of that was um, based on the discovery of the endocannabinoid system, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, I think everybody here, um, from what uh, Mo has told me, is obviously either has endometriosis or in the process of getting a diagnosis of endometriosis. Um, therefore, I'm not going to waste your time telling you what endometriosis is or really even most of the symptoms and all of the usual blurb that I would give um, before a presentation. But I think it's really important to talk a little bit about um, endometriosis and um, and the, oh, sorry, and the fact that it's obviously, as, as I'm sure everyone in the virtual room knows, it's not just pain. Um, so we people with endometriosis tend to have a lot of what we call comorbidity. So these are other things um, that they have at the same time as their endo. And what we know from the research is that um, issues with depression and anxiety are very, very common. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome, migraines, back pain, fibromyalgia, fibroids, autoimmune disorders, and IBS are all commonly um, diagnosed alongside endometriosis. And, and it's actually almost 100%. So almost everyone with endo uh, experiences at least one comorbidity. Now, interestingly, some of these might not actually be comorbidities. So irritable bowel syndrome might not actually be IBS, but actually might be part of endometriosis itself and, and likewise with chronic fatigue syndrome I think we're kind of now rethinking that actually fatigue is a is a characteristic symptom of endometriosis because it's so incredibly common um, the reason I'm talking about this is when we're talking about endometriosis management um, we're often thinking about you know primarily how to deal with the painful symptoms because they are the most common. But when we're thinking about um, medical management, for example, so pharmaceuticals and medication, we need to also think about how do we treat these common comorbidities? And um, especially depression and anxiety, very common in people with endometriosis and very common in people with chronic pain in general. So it's not, it's nothing specific about endometriosis, but I'm sure, um, you know, it, it's the, the constant pain and also, you know, struggling to, you know, um, be believed, get uh, the right treatment, um, you know, it, it obviously can predispose people to um, depression and anxiety. And also poor sleep, um, whether it's caused by the pain itself or whether it's to do with the, the anxiety perhaps, for example, also um, not only impacts on quality of life, but we know that poor sleep in general actually is something that needs to be addressed because it can by itself cause a lot of negative health outcomes. So the reason I'm talking about this is because when we talk about cannabis it's, and we're talking about digestion and mental health, it's important to know these are commonly experienced with endometriosis and that's why it's important that we target these and we talk about these, not just the pain. So why do we need a new treatment? So just come. I thought I'd put it. Uh, no, nope, never mind. I thought I'd move that slide. We'll stick with it. Um, okay, so obviously I think most people again will know that um, opioids are very commonly prescribed in um, endometriosis. So these are things like endone, uh, tapentadone, 
uh, sorry, to pentalol, uh, tramadol, depending on where you are. Um, so quite interestingly, really, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that um, opioids should be used outside of acute pain. So the research shows that opioids are not great for chronic pain. Basically, they don't seem to have the effectiveness over time that we expect. And obviously, there's quite a lot of safety concerns. Now, that's certainly not to say that opioids can't be effective or you should stop taking your opioids or you should feel bad about taking opioids. But it is something that um, for most people with endometriosis, opioids over long periods of time are um, not ideal and probably isn't something that was norm is normally recommended. However, despite this, um, we don't have really much data about Australia yet, but certainly in America, um, women with endometriosis have a four times greater risk of chronic opioid use compared to women without. Um, so that's really concerning. Um, and also opioids are often prescribed across alongside another class of medications called benzodiazepines. Uh, so these are things like Valium, um, and these are commonly prescribed for anxiety, but they're also used in chronic pain as well. And the concern about this is that both of these individually, so opioids and benzodiazepines, um, have significant risk of cognitive impairment, um, but it's mostly the addiction and potentially severe withdrawal syndrome we're really worried about, um, especially long-term use of benzodiazepines beyond around six weeks is generally not recommended. And when you combine the two, you have a much greater risk of overdose and addiction. So this is really important to, I guess, talk about at the beginning. Why, why do we even bother with medicinal cannabis? Why are we talking about it? Why are we looking into it? And that's because at the moment, some of the medications which are used to control pain really just they're not great, they, and we really do need to look for something uh, which is safer and um, even more effective than opioids where possible. Um, and also really important to note that while opioids can have benefits on pain, they can make some of the other endo symptoms like digestive issues, aka endo belly, um, and fatigue worse because they can cause constipation and cognitive impairment, so they can make you feel very tired and out of it. Um, likewise with benzos, they might actually reduce anxiety um, or improve your sleep for a short time, but once you come off them, there's a high risk of, of rebound anxiety or withdrawal, especially after extended use. So again, not, not fantastic long term. And as I said, neither of these treatments actively target depression, digestive symptoms, or any of the other, you know, kind of non-pain um, related symptoms that we see in endometriosis. So let's talk about um, the history of cannabis. Um, so when we, probably important to talk about two definitions here, I suppose. So when we're saying cannabis, we're talking about cannabis, the plant in general. So this is cannabis that um, either is cultivated by professionals um, to pharmaceutical standards, or it's growing in a, a bush somewhere near your house. So we're talking about the plant when we're talking about cannabis. When we're talking about medicinal cannabis or medical cannabis, as it's called in some countries, what we're talking about is a, a quality controlled product, which is made by a particular company under particular standards, and it's prescribed by a medical doctor for a particular condition. So really important right from the beginning, medicinal cannabis is a type of cannabis, but it's produced in a particular way and it's kind of delivered in, in a medical treatment. Um, the other type really is illicit cannabis, and this is what you might go and uh, chat to a friend about and, uh, you know, be able to buy from um, a neighbour or someone down the road. So, uh, and that illicit cannabis is quite different. Obviously, often we usually don't know what's in it, so the different compounds and things like that. And, and there is risks of things like... Um, heavy metals and pesticides and things like that. So there is a difference between uh, the two, even though they're both cannabis in general. So cannabis, um, we usually think of cannabis, we think of, I guess, 
the flowers, um, the buds, um, you know, which you usually will see, but actually um, there's also seeds which are used in Chinese medicine, for example, to help with constipation because they have a very high um, oil content. Um, so often cannabis has been used lots of different parts of the plants for millennia. Um, and as a matter of fact, the um, one of the early uh, Chinese medicine textbooks around 2700 BC um, talked about um, the use of these cannabis seeds for digestive issues. There was a resurgence um, of um, cannabis use in kind of the 1800s. Uh, some of you might have seen the memes going around uh, with cough syrups where they've got uh, morphine and cannabis and alcohol in them. So it was quite popular then. Unfortunately, probably not particularly easy to get it your hands on um, these days. But it definitely was mentioned not only therapeutically, but specifically actually for um, some um, reproductive health conditions, especially period pain and uh, hyperemesis. Um, obviously, we would definitely not recommend taking it for hyperemesis um, now, but that was certainly something that was um, considered to be an effective treatment at that time, long before the invention of um, ondensitron, for example. So it was. Um, used as an anti-emetic. And so we obviously know that there was no real diagnosis of endometriosis back at this time. Um, and, you know, the, we, we didn't know what it was. Um, and, but, you know, when we read some of the evidence, it suggests that a lot of the symptoms they're reporting certainly line up with what we would consider to be endometriosis symptoms. And so it may have been used at that time. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the kind of resurgence and in interest of um, looking and researching medicinal cannabis as a potential, um, I guess, medical treatment has come about with the, I guess, rediscovery almost of the um, endocannabinoid system or ECS. Um, it's not just us that has the ECS, it's in birds and fish and other mammals. Um, but surprisingly for something that's a relatively recent discovery, so really just in, since uh, first in 1976, um, and then a lot more work was done in the 90s. Um, but considering it's a major um, system involved in the regulation of homeostasis, which is just a fancy way of saying it um, keeps our body balanced, if you like. So that's homeostasis is just keeping things in balance. Um, but considering it's a major system and it's actually all around the body, um, it's uh, quite interesting that it was relatively recently discovered. And it's still, as far as we know at the moment, not really a focus of teaching at all for medical students, although there is some postgraduate kind of study they can do. Um, and so here we're talking about the, the history of kind of some of the um, components of um, the uh, endocannabinoid system and um, cannabis and endogenous um, endocannabinoids. So it's probably good now to talk a little bit about um, what's the difference between an endocannabinoid and a cannabinoid. So endo isn't related to endometriosis, it just means within. Um, so this is something that your body produces itself. So the endocannabinoids are, are can cannabinoids that your body produces within itself. And hence the name endocannabinoid system. And cannab exogenous cannabinoids or external cannabinoids are cannabinoids which work through the system. They bind to different receptors, but they're from the outside. So obviously the most famous um, endo, uh, uh, sorry, exogenous cannabinoid, I think everyone will know, is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. So we'll talk a little bit more about THC later, but I think most people recognize what THC is. Um, it's able to be chemically synthesized, um, but it's obviously present in all forms of cannabis. Unlike hemp, which has um, CBD, but it doesn't have THC. Um, and then in the late 80s, the first cannabinoid receptor, CD1, was identified. So this is a receptor which binds to cannabinoids, both endocannabinoids and exogenous cannabinoids. And then probably the biggest 
one of the most important discoveries was the discovery of endocannabinoid called anandamide. Um, and so this was the first time that an endocannabinoid had been discovered. And this, again, binds to these particular receptors. We've now discovered other receptors like CB2. Um, and then there's been other endocannabinoids um, after uh, the discovery of anandamide. So this is just a little explanation of what it's all about. So you have these cannabinoid receptors on the cell wall. So the thing that looks like kind of a slightly mutant sperm is um, fatty acids, which make up the cell wall. And these um, the, the little loops there are binding sites. And so what happens is endocannabinoids, like the anandamide, which is on the left here, bind to these and they activate these little protein units down here and give the signal to do something. And then these endocannabinoids are broken down by these types of enzymes here in number three. So this is how the, sorry, this is how the endogenous endocannabinoid system works. So that's great, but why is it so important? Well, the endocannabinoid system is kind of, I guess the body is riddled with um, endocannabinoid binding sites. But for endometriosis, we're probably really interested in where it is in the female reproductive tissues. But there is also a lot of um, endocannabinoid binding sites um, which affect neurology as well. So when we're talking about sleep and depression and anxiety, these are also modulated through the, the ECS. And one of the major ways it does this is the ECS is able to kind of modulate itself, the um, hypothalamo-pituitary-ovarian axis. Um, and so hence, it's thought that there can be modulation um, by the ECS of hormones, which are released by um, the, the HPO. The uterus also contains a lot of AEA, which is anandamide. And there's a lot of these um, receptors expressed in the ovaries and endometrium. So what this really means is, there's a lot of endocannabinoids in the uterus. There's a lot of receptors around the uterus and in the endometrium, which respond to this anandamide. So there's obviously something going on there where um, changing these levels of anandamide binding to these receptors is a crucial part of normal functioning of um, the reproductive system. And we know that um, the endocannabinoid system seems to be responsible for things like embryo transplant, uh, sorry, transport implantation. So when the, egg, the, the fertilized egg implants into the wall, folliculogenesis, so when the um, follicles are generated on the egg, um, how they mature. Um, and also obviously really importantly for endometriosis in the modulation of pain. So these are the two um, in, uh, kind of phytocannabinoids, the exogenous cannabinoids that we know the most about. So at the moment, I think the last count is around 150 cannabinoids we've identified um, within cannabis. And that's just the cannabinoids. There's also other um, compounds such as terpenes, which um, give cannabis its particular smell. But also some terpenes definitely seem to have um, physiological actions as well. So they also are part of the therapeutic, um, potential therapeutic benefit of um, cannabis. So it's not just the cannabinoids, um, but other terpenes like limolanine and others, they also seem to have some much milder, but anti-inflammatory actions, anti-anxiety, and um, some of them actually antibacterial as well. So what's interesting is that um, despite both being phytocannabinoids, THC and CBD, um, and you see like the fancy picture of them, um, they, they look pretty similar, um, but they actually act in very, very different ways. And so THC actually binds to these CB1, CB2 receptors. So it actively, um, it is a um, partial agonist, which means it partially activates these receptors. Um, Whereas if CBD, interestingly, despite, again, being a um, cannabinoid, doesn't bind that we know of to these receptors really at all. And it actually affects the body in different ways. So it comes via these 
um, so it activates these other channels. Um, and one of these, the 5-HT1A, is involved in serotonin uh, synthesis and modulation. Um, and these are often involved in um, pain modulation. So when we look at, at the activities, they're slightly different. Um, THC has analgesic, so it's a painkiller. It's an anti-emetic, so it stops people feeling nauseous and vomiting, hence why they recommended it for hyperemesis. Um, although, obviously, we know now that cannabis use in pregnancy is definitely uh, not recommended. Uh, it's also an anti-inflammatory, an antipyretic, so it stops itching. Um, it seems to dilate the lungs. It's a muscle relaxant. It seems to have some neuroprotective effect on the brain, and that is part of the reason why there's a lot of research at the moment looking at um, the use of medicinal cannabis on things like Alzheimer's. Um, CBD has similar um, action. So you might have seen that, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about um, the anti-epilepsy um, um, properties of CBD. And this is mostly in children. And it's a reasonably high dose, but they definitely seem to have this anti-convulsant effect. Again, it also has analgesic, so painkillers, anti-inflammatory, anti-nausea, um, antioxidant, neuroprotective, and also unlike THC, it seems to have an anxiolytic effect. So it, it's anti-anxiety. And we think some of this actually um, is interesting. So it means that a, um, a particular type of cannabis, which might have slightly less THC and slightly more CBD, might be less prone to giving people feelings of anxiety um, or um, paranoia, which sometimes are experienced, um, you know, when you've, um, if you've had, you know, perhaps you don't really smoke or use a lot of cannabis and you're using it for the first time, a lot of people report they feel quite paranoid. Um, and we think that higher levels of CBD are probably important to reduce that kind of um, paranoia level. So in a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about, actually, the importance is the ratio of the THC to CBD. And that's going to be really important in its kind of therapeutic effects. So like I said, THC is a partial agonist. Um, so it binds very similarly to anandamide. Um, so it's quite, uh, it's it's a strong, uh, I guess, the link between THC and the, um, the receptor it's binding to is pretty strong. Um, and we think that it's actually the binding to the CB1 receptor, which makes THC give its um, psychoactive effect. So when we say psychoactive, just a fancy way of saying you're feeling pretty high or stoned. Um, there is some new research now to suggest that um, the runner's high, you know, that you get after doing a lot of intense exercise may actually also be modulated by the endocannabinoid system as well. So suggesting that it has this kind of mood regulating uh, ability. So we won't go over those again, but those are just the references for each of those um, claims that I made. Um, and like I said, it's um, CBD is non-intoxicating. That's probably really important. Um, and it binds at these different receptors. So it acts in a very, very different way to THC. So just at the end of this, um, it's important to perhaps talk about here um, the composition of um, cannabis. We'll talk about optimal ratios in a little while, but if you, um, this is where illicit cannabis and medicinal cannabis really start to diverge. So each different type of cannabis cultivar, so the different strain, has different levels of THC and CBD. And so, and on top of that, they also have different terpenes and other cannabinoids. So they can be quite a significant difference in how people feel after they are ingesting these different types of um, cannabis. So with medicinal cannabis, um, it's much more like a pharmaceutical in the fact that it's actually, um, it's prescribed as a particular product. So for example, you might be um, given a product which is an oil, and it might be what we call a balanced product. So it's an, um, there's a one-to-one -one ratio between THC and CBD. So that means when you're taking the oil, you'll get the same amount of THC as you will of CBD. Um, there is also what we call high CBD um, strains. They tend to be, again, in oils rather than um, smoked at this stage, but this might be um, 
uh, CBD product where there's 20 times the amount of CBD that there is THC. So with that product, you're less likely to get the, um, the psychoactive effects because you're getting much less THC in there. There's also CBD isolates, which is where there is less than 0.05% um, THC. So it's, it's in, in, for all intents and purposes, it's basically pure, it's CBD only. Um, and so this has been developed for people who want no THC at all. And in theory, it should not cause positive um, drug driving um, tests, for example. And then when it comes to inhaled cannabis, it's very similar. Um, most inhaled cannabis in Australia at the moment tends to be THC dominant, um, and that's the medicinal cannabis um, and much lower CBD amounts. But again, for medicinal cannabis, we know exactly the amount of THC in the product and we know the amount of CBD. Those are the main things we um, categorize it on. In contrast, illicit cannabis tends to be bred for very high THC levels, not always. Um, but traditionally, it has been. Obviously, most people who are purchasing illicit cannabis are doing so to get high. They want more THC. So it's much harder to kind of dose um, illicit cannabis, unless, of course, you're growing it yourself or you're really good friends with the person who's growing it and you might have some idea about the particular strain and how they measure these things. But for most people, obviously, it's a bit of a uh, shot in the dark. You don't necessarily know what you're getting. So you might find that... Um, you know, it's a very, very high THC strain, which might make you feel, you know, a little bit more paranoid, or conversely, it might not have enough THC to help manage your pain. Um, but the THC and CBD ratio is probably the most important thing for us at the moment. We're likely to find that there's many, many other factors, but obviously this is still a relatively new field of research. So we know about the endocannabinoid system. Why do we care about it in endometriosis? Well, as I said, the ECS has extensive involvement throughout the reproductive system. And we think that ECS, the modulation of it, um, there's some evidence to suggest that it might be effective in reducing endometriosis-associated pain. We'll talk about that more um, in um, the next slides. So what was really interesting is that there seems to be some evidence, and this is in humans now, um, that the ECS is dysregulated in people with endometriosis. So what we see is increased levels of anandamide and um, 2-AG, so those are the two endocannabinoids, and a reduction in CB1 receptors. So we think these, and this is compared to um, people without endometriosis, we think these changes might be potentially responsible for um, some of the symptoms, but also maybe they also drive lesion proliferation and progression. So um, there's no single answer as to why endometriosis develops. There's a number of theories, but definitely there is some evidence to suggest that maybe ECS dysregulation might be part of it. So in theory, cannabis might slow the progression due to its effects on angiogenesis. So it prevents new blood vessel formation. Apoptosis it causes cell death. Um, it also seems to um, slow nerve innovation and cell migration in, um, in dysfunctional cells. So the answer for all of this is these are strong hints kind of pointing in a particular direction. Most of these studies are in mice. Um, and so mice are not little furry humans. So we always need to take a very large grain of salt with this. And so still a lot of work to be done here, but there's enough to suggest that this is something that should be looked into. So why, why have this talk, I suppose? Why have you come to listen to me rabbit on? You probably wanna know what role might cannabis play in endometriosis or chronic pelvic pain treatment. I should probably say at this stage, there's no real reason to believe that um, chronic pelvic pain caused by things other than endometriosis, they probably will respond in a similar way. Um, so we don't have strong evidence for that, but it is quite likely that, especially for the pain relieving aspects, it's probably um, if you have, say, chronic pelvic pain from adenomyosis, for example, it probably will show a similar result. But again, we don't know there's still a lot to be done. The most important 
uh, an interesting thing for many of us is that um, cannabis use in other chronic pain conditions has resulted in what we call the substitution effect. Um, so the substitution effect is simply that um, once uh, it's a, an effect which has been noticed in a lot of different populations where when you start taking um, cannabis, whether it's medicinal cannabis or illicit cannabis, people commonly report a reduction in medications that they use to manage their condition. And the most common of these is opioid analgesics. Um, so that's, I guess, this is why we started to get interested in this area. So it's been known for quite some time that there's a substitution effect. And so given the fact that um, pain is so difficult to control for most people with endometriosis, they often are using opioids and other um, medications, which you know perhaps might not be ideal in the long term. Um, is medicinal cannabis something that would be able to provide some pain relief, some symptom control, and reduce their need for medical management through pharmaceuticals? So that was the idea. It's not um, probably important to point out it's not a cure, um, and it can't be a cure because we don't actually know what causes endometriosis. Um, and so at the moment, I would consider that cannabis is a symptomatic treatment. While, like I said in the previous slide, there's some suggestions that it may change progression. At the moment, we actually don't even have much data at all on how endometriosis progresses. So it's very hard to kind of make a lot of claims in that area, but it's something that we want to look into. So at the moment, all it is is a nice suggestion, but I would say really it's a symptom management at this case, at this time, until we know more. And quite interestingly, um, what we found, again, it's in a mouse, is that um, when you regularly um, Delta 9, so THC has been uh, administered to mice, um, they seem to show less signs of being in pain and sensitive to, I guess, stimulation. Um, and like I said, it seems to prevent the development of, of these particular cysts. But this is in a mouse model with surgically induced endometriosis. It's not, a, not, not humans. So again, coming back to the caveat, uh, it's interesting, but it's certainly not conclusive. So let's talk a little bit about the work that um, Justin and I have done. So, I'd like to give full credit to my amazing PhD candidate, Justin Sinclair. He's been working in the cannabis space for many, many years, um, mostly through his work with United in Compassion. He is absolutely the cannabis expert. I am, am not. I am just um, happy to be associated with him. So we've done a lot of work together. Um, and I'd just like to talk through some of our key findings so you can see I guess what justification or what evidence we've got for potential use of um, medicinal cannabis and endometriosis. So here's two papers um, that we have written. So one's obviously um, uh, from Australia and you might have contributed to that. So if so, thank you, that was done in 2017. And then um, we also um, found, um, we looked at um, the, the cannabis specific data for that, which Justin wrote up and then we did another similar study in New Zealand, then we've done a couple since then. So what was the important findings? Um, so this is from Justin's paper, Cannabis Use Self-Management Strategy Amongst Australian Women with Endometriosis. Um, so what we found was there was quite a significant improvement in symptoms. Now these were just self-reported. Um, so really important to acknowledge that, um, you know, this is what people told us. Um, and so there's, there is some issues, you know, and how accurate this kind of information is. Um, so, you know, that's really needs to be kept in mind because we can only go what people tell us. Um, so very different to kind of clinical trials in this case. So what we, um, the classes for this is we said significant improvement was anything which was over a 50% reduction in the severity and or the duration of a symptom. Moderate was 25 to 50% reduction in severity and or duration. Slight was under 25% of those. So looking outside pain, which was considered to be um, significantly reduced, we also found these figures. So almost two thirds reported a significant um, to moderate improvement in their anxiety, similar numbers in depression, similar numbers in nausea and vomiting, similar in gastrointestinal disturbances, and um, 
you know, almost, so 83% um, significant to moderate improvement in their sleep. So we found that all of this was in addition um, to the pain reduction. Um, with things like sleep, it's obviously really difficult to tease apart whether it's an improvement in sleep itself or whether be people being in less pain meant that they were able to sleep easier. It's from a survey like this, no way for us to, to be able to pick that apart, but this is what we found. So some consistent improvements across a lot of common um, symptoms or common comorbidities that people with endo have. Sorry, Dr. Mike, just to interrupt, uh, we're just a five minute um, uh, warning reminder till we have our tea break, but you know, you do what you need to do. Okay, all right. Um, so we'll just continue on. In New Zealand, we found that um, cannabis use was really popular, um, really common, um, and similar findings to the Australian ones, so that their symptoms were, you know, over 80% said their symptoms were much better for pain, similar for sleep and nausea and vomiting, about 60%. And now we start to talk about the substitution effect. So over half were able to completely stop a medication, and most commonly this was analgesics, so pain-relieving medication. And um, the most common type of analgesic was opioids. So in New Zealand, that's quite commonly tramadol, um, but 40% um, of um, the analgesics they're able to stop was tramadol. So that's quite a significant um, reduction in opioid use. Um, so now we were interested in looking at um, how does the ratio or the type of um, way you take cannabis affect your endometriosis pain? And what we did is we looked at a, an app called Strain Print. They collected um, this data from uh, people in North America, so US and Canada, um, and over 16,000 cannabis sessions were um, uh, collected as part of this. Um, the important thing is what we found was most people were using it for their pelvic pain, which is perhaps not surprising. And um, inhalation was definitely the most common. And this is in people who are using legal medicinal cannabis. So this is only collecting legal medicinal cannabis. So vaporization, very, very popular. Oil was less popular. And topical and transdermal products, so ones that you put on your skin, um, were really, really rare um, at this time. Um, so what we found was this is reasonably complicated to explain, um, but... Uh, what we found was that um, especially there was a strong um, reduction in pain, especially. Um, and what we found was THC seemed to be more important for that, especially when you were um, inhaling it, whereas when you were ingesting it, so taking it through an oil, CBD seemed really important. Um, regardless, THC was the most important component for pain relief. Um, so this is important because CBD oil, which is often being sold by influencers on Instagram, um, probably isn't going to cut it and also not legal to buy. Um, we found that really it didn't matter whether you inhaled or ingested it for your pelvic pain, but how quickly the um, um, pain reduction came on is very different. So most people who took, um, who take inhaled cannabis find that they get relief or reduction in their symptoms was within three to five minutes, while oral products tend to be more 60 to 90 minutes or more. Um, we did find that oral products seem to be better for mood, while the inhaled method seemed to be slightly superior for pain. The last one that I'd like to talk about is just some more data which supports the same thing, so I won't spend too much time on it, but again, we looked at another study which looked at both New Zealand and Australia. We found, again, Lots of reductions in um, opioids, uh, neuroleptics. So these are things like Lyrica or gabapentin, um, anti-anxiety medication and sleeping medication. So again, reflecting the same thing um, that we had. So why is this not a great thing? Well, taking opioids or benzodiazepines or neuroleptics for a long period of time, it's not necessarily good to stop them cold turkey and you shouldn't be stopping them without speaking to your doctor. Um, so they need to usually be tapered. And what we found, which was really concerning, is a lot of people didn't talk to their doctor about their cannabis use, um, over half, as a matter of fact. So really concerning that people might be reducing medications without um, speaking to their medical practitioner about this, which is 
you know, potentially could have really bad, um, you know, effects. So key findings, um, people with endo are using medicinal cannabis. Um, they're also using illicit cannabis, often due to a lack of effective pain and symptom management. Um, they're reporting improvements in pain, sleep, mental health, and digestion. They're reporting reductions in opioids, benzos, and other medications. Most people are still using illicit cannabis, and most people are inhaling it. So the last thing I just want to talk about before the break is if I can already get medicinal cannabis, why do we need to do research on it? Now, thankfully, people in WA can actually get medicinal cannabis from um, their doctor can prescribe it for any indication, but it's not the same across all states. So currently, the TGA has medicinal cannabis being prescribed for the following conditions. And obviously, pain um, and nausea and vomiting are very common with endo. Um, but medicinal cannabis is not on the ARTG, Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. So it's not on the PBS. So anyone who's purchased medicinal cannabis will know it is not cheap. And the key reason for it not being on the ARTG and therefore not under PBS is that there's not enough scientific evidence for its effectiveness. And some states such as Tasmania actually require scientific evidence to be provided to support the prescription. And again, only some health insurers cover medicinal cannabis because of the lack of evidence. So we're really keen on generating the evidence that we need um, to see, is it effective? What is it effective for? What symptoms um, seem to respond best? And then if it is effective and beneficial, making sure that it's on the ARTG covered by the PBS so it's not so expensive since it's already such an expensive disease to have endometriosis, adding more cost, more hoops to jump through um, and more red tape is just not benefiting anybody. And that's it from me. Thanks. Um, I've got a few questions here and, and also if people want to talk about dosaging more generally, I'm really happy to talk about that. Um, so a couple of people have asked about THC and CBD. Um, so we think, um, and I'll just pop the, the link to this in the chat so everyone can have a look if they're interested. So that's a link to our paper that looked at the different um, effects of um, CBD and, and THC. Um, so the answer is we, we think that THC is important um, and we think it's because it does modulate these CB1 and CB2 receptors directly, whereas um, CBD seems to have a much weaker analgesic effect. But interestingly, again, you know, this is where we're, the hype about CBD and even medicinal cannabis, to be honest, it um, outstrips, you know, our evidence. We don't have a lot of studies or any that I know of really that look at, you know, a THC dominant versus a CBD dominant. Um, and that is something that we're actually going to be looking at in our upcoming clinical trial, hopefully starting at the end of this year. Um, but it seems like THC is, is important. And the evidence for that is not only when we looked at, obviously, this particular data that was collected. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about why that's important. So the Strain Print app asks people to put in the name of the product. So because they're only using um, legally prescribed medicinal cannabis, um, then they know, so strain print has the exact composition, so they know exactly how much THC, exactly how much CBD. So that's how we were able to look at these particular ratios and figure out what's important. So we did find that each time you increase the THC, you did get a small improvement in pain. Um, the other reason we think the THC is important is that most of the research um, that we've done has been with people with using illicit cannabis. And we know that illicit cannabis tends to be bred for very, very high THC levels. Um, and so often these can be, you know, five fold higher than um, sometimes low levels used in, in medicinal cannabis. So they can be very, very high, uh, no pun intended. And so we think that um, some THC is important, but it's likely that too much will not necessarily um, will not necessarily be more beneficial. So there's probably an upper limit to how much you need to manage your pain um, and too little might mean that you're being underdosed. 
Um, and someone asked, if you're taking THC, will it show up on drug tests? Absolutely, it will. Um, so this is a current major issue in Australia, especially in New South Wales, is that if you've been legally prescribed medicinal cannabis um, and you say, take it today, um, you might use an oil, which normally lasts around six hours. And then tomorrow evening, you're out driving and someone at the police pull you over and do a roadside a drug test, you will show most likely show positive, despite the fact that you're no longer impaired. Um, and this is, to my knowledge, an instant loss of license. Um, we've never seen this held up in court. So there has been several cases, um, one major one that I know of where it was thrown out. Um, but there is also um, a case recently where there was a government employee who tested positive for THC, despite having a prescription, they still suspended him or fired him. I'm sorry, I can't remember which one. So at the moment, there is a lot of work going on to reform the drug driving laws in New South Wales. And um, my team put in a submission to the Senate uh, based on that as well. Uh, because at the moment, what is ironic a little bit is you can take Endone, you can take Valium together, um, and drive, uh, which would make me quite impaired, um, and that's fine. But you can't, you can't have medicinal cannabis the day before and drive um, uh, the following day. So, um, someone asked, "What's the likelihood of being held in court?" So, again, every case that we know of has been ha has never progressed. No one's ever been charged with. Um, drug driving when there has been a medicinal cannabis prescription. Um, so obviously illicit is different, but if you have a prescription from your doctor, we're not, I'm not aware of, of any. Um, if, if there has been some, it must have been quite um, recently. Um, how long does it show up in your system? That's an excellent question. It's how long is a piece of string? Um, so THC is stored in fat cells. Um, it all depends on uh, the amount of fat cells you have. It depends on how often you're using it and the form. So if you're a heavy user and using it quite a lot, um, you will sometimes it can last, um, as far as I know, it, you know, you can test positive even 30 or more days after your last time using. So that's why it's these hypersensitive tests that they're using are, um, you know, they're really, really not particularly uh, accurate because they're not detecting impairment at all. They're just detecting very, very small um, amounts and I think it's in nanograms of THC. So at the moment, um, a, in theory, a CBD isolate, so this is the one which has less than 0 0.05 um, parts of THC, should not um, ping on a roadside drug test. But as far as I know, no one has actually tested that yet. Um, so this is a major issue in, in New South Wales in terms of the drug driving laws at the moment. So, um, and in terms of obviously workplace laws, that's a, a separate kind of um, issue. And it really will depend, I guess, on um, what the outcome of this particular case is as to what kind of um, precedent this might set. Um, so I hope that explains a little bit. Um, so just talking a little bit about CBD. So a lot of um, medicinal cannabis uh, doctors tend to, they may push CBD first as a treatment. Um, the reason for that is that it's obviously, it's not, it's not psychoactive. It's a little bit more socially acceptable in a way, strangely enough, to prescribe CBD than, than THC. Um, so there is still a lot of stigma and holdover from uh, cannabis as an illicit drug. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that's a really uh, important um, probably contributing factor um, as to why they're happy with CBD. But I think it's really important if we um, um, if we are looking at, um, you know, effective treatment that I think it's, you know, you should be able to go back to your doctor and say, you know, I, this is not uh, having the effect. And hopefully that paper that I put in the thing, you know, you can send them that or take that with them. Um, but this is, again, part of the reason why we need this ongoing research to, to show, you know, what is or isn't superior and what they should or shouldn't be prescribing. Um, but CBD, um, to give you some idea, the, the doses that are used in epilepsy studies, even for children, tend to be 300 to 600 milligrams a day. So, you know, often people are being prescribed quite small amounts of CBD. Um, and as um, someone mentioned in the chat, 
uh, it becomes very expensive because you need to use a lot of CBD. So, um, um, uh, and so this, yeah, it, it, you know, you might find that, you know, for most people, if they're on a balanced oil, which is 10 milligrams of THC and 10 milligrams of CBD um, per mil, that they'll often find that half a mil twice a day would be quite a lot. Um, and that, that we should, should definitely take care of most of the symptoms because that's 10 milligrams of THC um, per day. So it is, that's a lot. Certainly for someone beginning, you, you, you don't want to take that much. Um, not if you're planning on doing anything in the next kind of day. Um, so often we will start you very, very, you know, you'll start very low and we call it low and slow and you'll start on probably just 0.1 of a mil morning and night and you'll move up slowly from there um, so a, a balanced product in my opinion is much more cost effective for most people because you have to use probably a quarter of the amount of the cbd and even some people who are taking several hundred milligrams of cbd a day still aren't really getting a lot of benefits for pain so i think that you know in that case you really need to either switch to another cannabis doctor who is more open to it and that would certainly be you know the first thing that i would suggest if they're refusing uh to consider thc um even though you've been on cbd for say several months and you haven't had the benefit because uh you know otherwise it could just be really really um it's not um particularly beneficial you know or cost effective for you to stay on that kind of product um I'm just sorry, I'm just scrolling back through here. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so someone asked um, in regards to adenomyosis alongside endometriosis, is the comorbidity likely to affect the potential pain relieving effects? The answer is again, sorry to sound a bit like a broken record, but we just don't know. We don't have any data on that. Um, it's possible. Um, we don't really fully, we don't really have a lot of data on people with endo plus adenomyosis versus adenomyosis alone and how they respond to treatment in general. Um, so it's really hard to, to, to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, they also said, how does surgery fit into a treatment plan with MC as the main source of medical management? I think that's obviously something that you would need to discuss with your, um, your surgeon. Um, it's not a, a contraindication for surgery. Um, you might find that you know, um, if medicinal cannabis is working for you, you know, and you wish, you know, and um, that may allow you to postpone surgery if that's what you want. You might find that post-surgery, you know, your symptoms have reduced but not gone. Again, medicinal cannabis might play a role in, you know, managing your symptoms. But, you know, that's really a discussion that you need to have between your surgeon and, and yourself. But um, in terms of, you know, taking medicinal cannabis, even quite close to surgery, there's no particular contraindications, but I, I obviously would suggest, you know, you speak to them about any potential interactions with anesthetics and other things, um, but there's not really any, you know, other particular things I can think of which would be contraindicated. Um, someone said, what do we say to doctors and specialists who don't agree we should be using MC for endometriosis? Um, I think that that's, you know, again, this is comes back to um, why do we need to do the research? Well, I think it's a reasonable position for many doctors to take that there's not a lot of research to suggest that, um, you know, medicinal cannabis is effective for endometriosis. So I think, you know, this is one of the driving factors why we're trying to get clinical studies up and running as soon as we can. So we've got the evidence. And that comes back again to being, um, you know, if we've got the evidence um, of effectiveness, especially cost effectiveness, um, because the government really cares about that, um, then, you know, the chance of it being on the um, ANTG and then on the PBS is much higher. So I think, you know, that my goal personally and that of my team is that we are trying to generate the evidence necessary uh, to, for the um, for the government to make the decision whether it should go on PBS or not, because that's that's really one of the big things that I'm very passionate about is that, you know, endometriosis is a very expensive disease. Um, it's expensive to manage um, when you take all the time, you know, when you put together all the time, you know, off work, the surgeries, the medicines, the physio, everything else you need to manage, you know, um, what we need to do is make treat effective treatments more cost effective and available, not less. Um, someone said, does full spectrum CBD have enough THC to have positive benefits? 
I think the problem is, is that full spectrum CBD is, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if that's, um, uh, you know, sometimes you'll see products on Instagram, which talk about full spectrum. Um, it's really hard to say uh, because it doesn't necessarily mean anything by itself. You'd have to know exactly what the composition was. So if you had, say, a CBD ratio of 20 to 1 and you were taking several mils a day, then yes, you probably have enough THC to make a difference. But um, full spectrum sometimes is used as a marketing term, which and it's a bit of a cover for them saying we don't actually test how much THC and things are in our products. Um, so just while we're talking about that, really probably good to point out uh, the only way you can get CBD legally in Australia at this moment is via a medical professional. You cannot buy it over the counter from the pharmacy at the moment. Um, there is changes in place, but uh, the pharmacy products must go through clinical trials before they're able to be advertised. Uh, none have completed that so far. And the ones that are currently running, I'm afraid to say, are pretty much all for sleep. Um, so it's unlikely there'll be a CBD product over the counter for endometriosis at the moment. Um, there are companies looking into this, but you cannot buy CBD from a pharmacy at the moment. Uh, if you purchase it online, um, it's also actually illegal. So the only it's it's not legal to purchase CBD um, outside of um, a health professional at the moment. Uh, I don't think the police are going to come and knock down your door. Uh, but uh, I would strongly recommend against it simply because most of the time uh, these CBD products that influencers are suggesting aren't necessarily, um, they're not tested. Uh, and so someone said, what's the difference between CBD prescription and the ones sold at health food shops? The answer is CBD is not health, uh, is is does not sell at a health food shop, at least not if they're following the law. They'll usually sell, this is where some of those terms like full spectrum extract uh, are used and it doesn't mean anything. Um, the only way, you know, what I would be looking for is um, analytics looking at exactly the amount of CBD per mil um, and then the other composition. So if they're talking about CBD, they should say something like um, 100 milligrams per mil, less than 0.05% THC per mil or something like that. So if you're not seeing that and you're seeing words like full spectrum hemp extract, um, I would suggest you're probably best off saving your money. Um, okay. Karen said, I looked up the Escolara study on the break and they use endometrial cells, not endometriosis lesions. I think most, um, like I said, um, I don't know of any studies in mice which use endometriosis lesions. Um, you can look up the work by Erin Greaves, Associate Professor Erin Greaves. She's done most of the work in this area. Um, but I think the important thing is what is um, endometriosis in mice? Um, they don't get it naturally. So obviously we're always going to be artificially inducing this. Um, so it's never going to match with um, that I know of, or at least I know they're working on this, but currently it, mice don't get endometriosis. Um, you know, we can't automatically assume that mice, mouse diseases and human diseases are the same. So that's why I always put a big caveat. Any kind of mouse studies and things like that are interesting, but they're not, you know, certainly I wouldn't be um, making any clinical decisions based on that. Um, Someone, uh, Amy said, is there any clinical studies that we can join? Not at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, so we have at least two that we're expecting to start in the next six to eight months. Um, and I, we'll definitely obviously be talking about that a lot on social media. Um, but at the moment, uh, unfortunately not. No, we're still, um, it's, uh, as you can imagine, trying to get a medicinal cannabis trial through ethics is not, um, it is a relatively challenging uh, proposition. So we will be running one study in Sydney. Um, so I'm sorry, I know that's no use for those in WA. Um, and then we have others planned, but part of the issue at the moment really is that with the differences in legal regulations between states, it does become really difficult to do an, a national study. So that's one of the reasons which is slowing down. So I'm sorry, um, Probably none in WA that I know of uh, at the moment. Um, 
yeah, I'm just, yeah, I don't know of a lot of work happening locally there. I think I've gone through everything that people have asked. I, if you've got anything else you want to ask, um, please pop it in the chat now. Just before, otherwise, um, I'll just wrap up and just talk quickly about um, dosage forms because I think that's um, that's important. So, um, so um, we know that you know the two the two major um, administration forms are oral, so that's like an oil, um, and um, that takes generally around 60 to 90 minutes to kick in. It lasts usually four to six hours, maybe longer, depending on how you process it. Um, it an oil is quite, it's relatively easy to dose, obviously, when you're using. Um, and um, sorry, it's relatively easy to dose. Um, and because you know exactly what you're going to get. Um, and so the only problem with that is also there's quite a long delay, um, 60 to 90 minutes, you know, so if you've taken too little or too much, you're not going to find out until it really kicks in and it often won't peak until several hours. So it can be quite useful in uh, things like a long term um, sleep. Um, for example, you know, if you're taking it at night, that can be great. Um, whereas inhaled, um, when we're talking about inhaled, this is everything from you know smoking or um, uh, you know to um, vaporizing. The positive aspects of vaporizing is there's a very very quick onset um, of time, um, and so you'll usually find three to five minutes you'll get some um, uh, you know some some symptom benefits starting. Usually fully affects you within fifteen minutes. It is a much shorter uh, time period, usually 60 minutes to two hours, sometimes three hours. The good thing about this is, I guess, it's great for pain flares, you know. So if you're suddenly getting pain, um, at, you know, suddenly breaking through your oil or it's just suddenly happening, then um, it's something that you can take and, you know, you should be able to get on top of the pain relatively quickly. Um, and um, it's also quite easy to dose, I guess, because... Uh, you know, you might inhale once, um, you wait five or 10 minutes, you see how you feel, you're able to inhale again. So it's a little bit easier to fine tune, you know, your dose between your symptoms and obviously feeling too impaired, which is always going to be the, the issue with um, anything containing THC. So it's not a, not a panacea. Um, one of the area um, is, um, uh, one of the areas that we're really interested in is looking at other delivery methods. So whether it's through um, uh, suppositories or pessaries, um, so delivering um, through the rectum or the vagina, um, could this be a method where we can have the pain relief, but without impairing people so much? Because obviously what we're really hoping for is to be able to deliver effective pain and symptom relief while people are still able to, you know, uh, to, to do their activities of daily living. Uh, not saying, you know, if you, you know, some people want the psychoactive effects, but many people don't. So it's really important that we try and look for um, ways to, to manage that. Uh, someone asked, what's the long-term impact of using and if someone wants to stop? That's an excellent question. The answer is we don't know. And the reason is, is that most studies have obviously been done on illicit cannabis, uh, which makes it very hard to know what people have taken. Um, you know, because they also have contaminants and um, other, you know, there's, there's potentially heavy metals and things like that. Um, it's certainly, you know, if you're worried about safety concerns, probably an oil, an oral oil is, is the safest option at the moment. Um, Vaporising is much less risky than smoking, but it's certainly not risk-free at all. Um, and um, so in terms of um, wanting to stop, there's certainly what we call cannabis use disorder. Um, and so this tends to be more um, psychological rather than physiological dependence, but it absolutely can be, you know, there can be some rebound symptoms when you stop. And these tend to be things like irritation um, and sleeplessness. So it's, it, it's not, um, you know, just because um, medicinal cannabis is natural doesn't mean that it's 
you know, free of, of potential side effects. And there's also much rarer conditions like um, cannabis hyperemesis disorder, where uh, you you know if you got that because obviously you use cannabis and you uncontrollably vomit. Um, so the answer is again, we still need to collect a lot more research. Um, this is often this is happening in America at the moment because they've had it legalized for several years. And the final question is, someone said, what's the difference between hemp and CBD? So CBD is just a chemical. It's just one of the cannabinoids. Hemp has some CBD in it, but the idea that, um, you know, what's often sold is this full spectrum hemp extract, there's, unless they're measuring the amount of CBD, we don't know. I, I, the two, hemp oil and CBD oil are not, um, uh, they're not equivalent. Cool. Well, I hope that that was helpful. Um, and I um, hope that, um, you know, if you are looking to um, use medicinal cannabis, you know, please speak to a professional and um, we will absolutely keep people updated on the progress of our research as well.